So, so I'll, I'll just um, go ahead and start. Um, good afternoon, everyone. And it's a pleasure to be with you today. And it's a special pleasure for me to introduce my dear friend, Celilia Belinda Claxton from Sayout, the Saanich Nation, a speaker of the Sanchathan language and a dear friend over many, many years. And we're going to talk to you today about um, about mostly the plants and places around Sydney Island and around the territory of the Saanich people um, that are important and have been important for thousands of years. Um, we call this talk Learning from the Earth because that's uh, where the source of knowledge comes from and it's been developed and shared over um, many, many generations. Uh, so, Celilia, um, welcome and thank you for joining me as uh, co-presenters of this. And I want to recognize you and the members of your nation. There you are, Celilia, with our friend, our mutual friend, Sethlema, Joan Morris from the Songhees Nation, um, and your nephew, Dr. Nick Claxton. Um, and Hayakwa for uh, to everyone from your nation. And I, I just want to say how much I appreciate you and your family and the other teachers that I've had as an ethnobotanist. Um, and you know, I met your mom many years ago, Elsie Claxton. She was an amazing knowledge holder and a dear friend and um, we spent a lot of time with both of our mothers out on the land and uh, brings back a lot of memories. We also worked with Vi Williams and uh, earlier with Christopher Paul from Sartlip. And we want to recognize all of those knowledge holders, the Elliott family, the Claxton family, uh, the Paul family, and all the others from the different communities of the Saanich Nation. Thank you to Beatrice and Stephanie and to others for the work that you're doing. And thanks to our friends, teachers, students, and supporters over the years. And I'm going to stop talking and turn it over to Celilia, who uh, can just go ahead and uh, introduce yourself, Celilia, if you want, and uh, talk about your background and your connections to plants. Thank you, Nancy. Uh, my name is Celilia. Um, I received that name from my grandmother, my mom's mother. Um, and this is my brother, Yalquetza. He's my oldest brother. And um, he uh, knew our language fluently. All my brothers and sisters spoke the language fluently. I, under I understood the language fluently spoke very little of it because I went to day school. And um, a lot of my plants and, and um, my teachings came from my mother, um, so she, um, she taught me quite a bit and she worked really closely with Nancy, her and Vi Williams. And, um, and uh, like I was saying, Earl is the oldest. And I learned uh, a lot from him as well. Um, all my brothers and sisters, uh, I think I have one brother left, my brother Lou, but my other brothers and sisters are all gone. Uh, my mom, she's been gone, be 21 years, March 31st. Mm -hmm. And she was 93 years old when she passed away. I think she probably would have lasted longer but she had a small little spot on her lungs. And, but she taught us a lot about plants and she taught us a lot about um, fishing and about um, um, there was a story that she told, told us of what my dad was um, taught about um, and that I think that's the English name is um, Consumption plant, isn't it, Nancy? 
It is Celilia and uh, yeah. or wild celery. We'll have a slide of it in a little mm -hmm. while. So a lot of my teachings and and about and the stories came from my mother and my late brother Earl, and um, and of course Nancy. I learned a lot from her too, and you know we've been pals in in the wilderness there and <laughs> learning about cedar plants, the book, the cedar trees, and different plants and different stories, and so um, I've been very fortunate. Thank you. Uh, thanks. Um, since we're sort of focusing a little bit on Sydney Island, um, I went back to some interviews that I did with uh, Celilia's late brother, Dr. Earl Claxton Sr., Ilquita. And um, he, he remembers traveling uh, with his family, with his parents, um, and stopping by at Sydney Island and a place on the cliffs where they, his dad could get water even in the hottest part of the summer, some seepage, uh, a spring that came down and they would always make some tea and get something to eat. And then they would uh, head, head on, on their way. Um, Earl knew lots about the places all around. There they are, the water is always dripping there. It doesn't matter how hot of a summer yeah, and then back down around the beach and then on home to Tseot. And he remembered how as kids they would go over to Sydney Island and, and be playing. And they, his parents would watch the water and it, it, there was a certain place, a certain level of the tide when a rock was uncovered or just barely covered and that's when they knew it was time to go. And then the current just carried them home. If they, they just all piled into the canoe right away and the current would almost take them home with very little work. Did you experience that, Celilia? Were you ever part um, of that? You were the I youngest, was, right? I was very, very young, but I, like my brother was saying and my mother, you know, that Sydney Island, um, and, I can't remember this in Chawthon name, but it meant that it was submerged by the waves. And the, and the, the waters were their roads. Um, they would travel all over the place. And I remember as a kid going to all the islands and, and, and I remember once my mom and dad went and stopped at one of the islands. It'll just about this time of the year and now when spring, and um, we used to go and she'd be going picking seaweeds. And my mom said, you go up there and, and go and pick your um, fawn lilies and the shooting stars and um, all the native plants. And I used to go and pick a bouquet of flowers. And I remembered that because of, I could smell them even before we even got to the beach. And my dad would be burning some kachming on the beach. And, and I asked him why he was burning. I was only eight years old. And I asked him, why are you burning kachming? And he says, we burn it because we have to make sure that um, we feed all the salmon mm -hmm. so that the salmon will return. So every beach that he, that he got to, he would remember to burn some kachming to um, thank the fish for being plentiful and make sure that they're welcome back again. And that's how important the kachming was for us. So the, um, I remember that very vaguely. And, um, but a lot of other history came from my mom and my brothers and sisters because I was about eight, nine years old, not too long after I lost my dad from a massive heart attack. And so my mom was alone the rest of her life and a lot of teachings from my mother. And she was telling me that the springs um, from all the islands, they knew all the spots were to get nice ice cold spring water. And now because of residential 
uh, homes now, they those spots are all dried up now. So they're not as plentiful anymore. Mm -hmm. That's so interesting because I read lo uh, a story that has been recorded from a Saanich uh, elder by Diamond Janess, who is an ethnographer with the National Museum. And it was about the salmon, the salmon people coming and how uh, they were, the young men who brought the salmon home mm -hmm. were told to burn kachmin all along the beach to feed the spirits of the salmon people. And mm -hmm. so it's interesting that you got that same teaching. That's so neat. There, they, there it is, the kachmin. And the, um, the first salmon ceremony has been brought back. And, and um, here it's been um, Being honored. Cele celebrated, honored at Seo, right near yes. Lilia's house. Um, a beautiful ceremony with the kachmin, which has a kind of a celery, spicy celery scent to it. And that was the um, um, Taki, the 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 um, uh, oh, what's the English name for that? No, the king of all fish. Anyways, that we always had to highly respect that fish um, and honor that um, sockeye. Uh -huh. It's called Taki because it's the king of all fish, and we would never be higher than the, than the sockeye, we always had to honor, highly respect that fish. And then when the first fish was caught, all the kids would honor it and bring, as you can see, they're bringing one home. And that would be our first catch of the, the year. And that's why the kids were the ones that would bring the first sockeye. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, and uh, you told me, Celilia, you and your mom used to sometimes get these onions down at uh, Sydney Spit. Yes. Uh, or yes, at uh, Seot. Yeah, at Seot or, or even wherever we can um, harvest them. You can really smell them. There's nice, strong onion smell. And they would use that and put them in their, in their cooking and when they're doing pit cooking um, in the cavity of the fish or the um, wild um, crab apples. Uh -huh. um, so just back up a bit and, and talk about this amazing knowledge system that is held by people living close to the land in, in any part of the world. It's a sometimes called traditional ecological knowledge and wisdom. And um, my friend Fikrit Burke has, has written about that, um, this knowledge and how important it is in, uh, for people to learn about sustainability, um, a cumulative body of knowledge, practice, and belief that's handed down through generations and is, um, is transmitted culturally. And here's uh, my dear friend, from the north, from the Kit Kat Nation, Helen Clifton. Um, she and her little granddaughter are pounding the halib dried halibut and her little granddaughter Janelle is learning about their culture while she's helping her grandma. And this was a common way for you to learn, wasn't it, Celilia? Just yes, taking yes. part in everything that your family did. Mm -hmm. Yes, we were taught at a very young age um, um, this is my mother. She's, um, um, I remember when we used to, when she used to teach us either harvesting plants or harvesting cedar or, or fish or clams or oysters or whatever. And she would tell me, she says, I'm going to show you once and I'm not going to show you again. So you watch very closely about how to clean fish or how to clean ducks. Because that was you, that was our way of you got to really pay attention and um, and learn because she wasn't going to teach us. She wasn't going to teach me the second time. It was only once, and and you had to pick it up really quick. So 
but um, that's how she was taught and we had to pay attention. And um, cedar is, um, we used to harvest to go make baskets. Um, it was part of our medicine. It was part of our cleansing um, um, for bathing. And it's called Hre. And um, so cedar was um, highly used in our communities. And there's a lot of stories about it as well. Thanks, Celilia. Mm -hmm. Yeah, these are, uh, this knowledge is, is so integrated and broad, but it, it covers, I, I like to say it covers all of the topics that you would learn at a university from uh, not just biology uh, and botany, but, but also education and philosophy and political science and linguistics and everything, um, because it covers not just the factual information about what a plant looks like and uh, even how it's used, what's edible and what's not, but it, it also encompasses the uh, belief system, the worldview, the respect that people have as reflected in the first salmon ceremony, for example the way uh, knowledge is passed on through stories and through participation, as Salilius talked about, and the ways of planning and making decisions about what to do and um, how to look after the, the land and the waters and so forth. So all of this, if you take any one plant like cedar, um, it, it, it embodies all of these different types of knowledge. And yeah, so our, for, go ahead, Celilia. I'm sorry, Nancy. Um, yeah, the um, a lot of our teachings and values, it came by our 13 moons. We're governed by 13 moons, not by the 12 months of the calendar. We're governed by the 13 moons. And each moon would tell us when to harvest, when do we gather food, when do we go and get medicines, our ceremonies, our dancing. Um, it was our, like Nancy said, it's our whole philosophy. That's what governed us. And, um, we were, we're, we are, and we, and still today we're the caregivers of this land. And, um, our, our worldview is not just by plants and animals, but even our sea life, um, everything in our sea is important. Um, so, um, it's, it's, so if one chain is broken, that chain reacts all the way around into our sea, into the sea life, our fish, the seals, our, our sea animals, our land animals, everything is affected. And so we were always had to respect everything that's around us. And, and, and those 13 moons is what governed us. And... Um, when do we harvest? When do we not harvest? When do we go and get clams? When do we get cedar? When do we go and get medicines? And all our ceremonies were all governed by the 13 moons. And the moons yeah. are named after some of those activities too, aren't they? Yes, yes. Can I actually ask a question about the 13 moons that I've been curious for, for quite some time. So yeah. I know they don't perfectly, like they don't align with the 12 month calendar. Um, but uh, how do I ask this question? So in the 12 month calendar, sometimes we have 13 full moons and sometimes we only have 12. I'm wondering if you would always have all 13 moons and if that would ever, it seems like it would like push the cycle a little later in the year if you were counting 13 moons, like your 13th moon would get later in the year every year. I don't know if that makes any sense. I think everything's early. Um, um, I've noticed in the last few years, um, everything is early. It, it doesn't coincide anymore. Right. Um, I find that everything's early. Um, I know that, you know, the, say the Kukwalish, the Swainson thrush bird will come out to ripen all of the um, salmon berries. 
and everything's early and it used to be really late and mm -hmm. um, even going to harvest I noticed that we always have to go and do things it doesn't coincide because I really think it's got uh, because of the climate change I think that's really made a big difference in terms of the 13 moons. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I've heard the same thing from other uh, First Nations up and down the coast. For example, the Git in the Kitkat Nation in the Somali language, the month of May is called Halila Laask, which means the month to gather seaweed. But nowadays the seaweed is ready earlier than May. It didn't used to be, but it, this is, makes it complicated because uh, the seaweed is ready when there's still rain and you can't dry the seaweed properly. So it, it throws everything out, just as Salilia was saying. Um, so yeah, usually June and August is uh, Shantaki and Shantatwan, those are the months um for june and august and that's when they were we usually go and harvest the um the camas but um but everything seems to be early um so our our uh, moons really don't coincide no more it's usually a little earlier than normal so but these little trailing blackberries those are i know that we used to go i always like to go pick those they got so much flavor that uh -huh. um, it puts a shame to all of the other berries that we, that they, that, that um, uh, like Logan berries or Tay berries, yeah. but these little trailing blackberries, they got so much flavor. It's so sweet. And um, um, I look forward to going picking them. We always enjoy picking them together, don't we? Yes. <laughs> and uh, long ago, uh, they used to make a fruit leather from these berries, from the juicy berries, mm -hmm. by cooking them up and spreading them out on a skunk cabbage leaf, uh, which has a waxy coating on it. You don't eat the skunk cabbage. That's not good for you. But to, it serves as a surface for drying the berries, and you can make your own fruit leather from these wonderful berries and it's so nutritious and a wonderful treat. Mm -hmm. Oh, oh, there's the Kukwalish. That's the um, Swainton thrush. And she's um, singing her heart out, trying to put some color in all the salmon berries. So she goes from bush to bush, trying to put some color in ripen, 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 ripen. She's singing kukalash, kukalash, kukalash. And she just goes around and sings her heart out. <laughs> I love that. It's a way of teaching kids about these connections too, because you can sing that song, what the Swains and Thrush sings. And uh, the children learn about the different varieties of salmon berries. There's the golden ones and the red ones and the dark ones. And the little bird is singing it's hard out to ripen them all. Yeah, <laughs> I love that. Yeah. Oh, My bird. That brings back really nice memories of um, of your mom and Vi Williams and the stories they told about Swains and Thrush and Raven and uh, how Swains oh, and that's Thrush a, that's could, a good story. <laughs> could ripen all the berries with its song yeah. and Raven. Raven tried to ripen the berries with his song. <laughs> <laughs> he couldn't do it. <laughs> oh, that was such a cute story. <laughs> yeah. I always oh. like that story. Yeah. <laughs> Here's a little bit of what Lily was talking about, the 13 moons. The, all, all of these different resources that people rely on were are available at are ripen and ready to harvest at different times of the year. And so people will travel around from one place to another as the things ripen and um, enjoy harvesting and then putting, uh, preparing and processing the food and uh, making it ready for winter use. And so it goes over 
over the years, over the generations, over thousands of years, the same kinds of seasonal rounds, they call it, or cycle. Mm -hmm. and yeah, that's uh, why we talk about 13 moons and And Celia, you talked about, uh, we were talking earlier about using fire, the use of fire mm. to, uh, to maintain certain areas and to keep the open prairies good for the camas. Mm -hmm. And that's all part of really a very sophisticated ways that people had of looking after this different species and making sure that there were enough and promoting their quality and their quantity over time by looking after tending tending the land cultivating the land all of those different practices that's so true i think those practices have kind of dwindled away in in the past because of um um parks canada and um, fisheries were always saying that we couldn't harvest any clams and we couldn't go and harvest any any um, berries and, or it was restrictive one way or another. But now that um, we're teaching our young, young people here in our communities about the berries now and about harvesting and about clearing and burning and trying to bring that practice back because that's how we used to make things more plentiful again. And it would bring back the canvas. It would bring back more um, of the berries back, the black caps, as well as the wild strawberries, the huckleberries, and the trailing berries. And they'd be more plentiful then. And um, I remember that my mom used to do that down here and down the res here. And, and we used to have the control burning um, just to make things more... Um, or other um, um, types of native berries to make them more plentiful again. And so that was a practice all the time. So um, I guess it, um, the Parks Canada, what they call control burning. But I mean, in those days, it was a practice for us all the time. So, but I see huckleberries and there's blue huckleberries as well further up the mountains, the blue huckleberries. And uh, that's what Nancy and I look forward to every summer. That's right. <laughs> oh my goodness, I have some nice photos of you with those, uh, the red huckleberries. Um, and just uh, to carry on with the way people looked after and tended the different resources, they also prune the berry bushes sometimes to make them grow better and produce more fruit, just like a farmer would uh, prune the trees in an orchard. Mm -hmm. Yes. And, yeah, we brought uh, our, we even brought our mothers out. Nancy and I brought our mothers out to pick huckleberries. And we would sometimes break the branches and bring them back to our mothers sitting who they couldn't go out bushwhacking like we did. So we'd bring them branches of the berries back to pick. And they just loved that, both of them. And, uh, you know, in a sense, the land, the, your territory, you could say was common in that people could use it. But there were, there were also protocols around who had the proprietorship, who owned certain places and oversaw those. It didn't, you needed to ask permission if you wanted to go and harvest camas or seagull eggs on somebody on, on an island that was recognized as belonging to someone. Am I right, Celilia? Yes, yeah. yes. I, I remember that um, when we were sort of free, we could go anywhere and we never had to ask permission and mom and dad and um, my uncles and my aunts. I mean, we used to go to Pender Island and we used to just go anywhere and, and get our clams and oysters and our seaweed and all our different plants. And we never used to ask permission before. Not until lately, we, we had to start asking for permission to go and harvest seagull eggs or seaweed or um, picking berries, clam digging, 
we used to do, they did a lot of pit cooking when we used to go and get clams. And I remember one time my mom and my, my, my late mother and my late sisters and my brothers, late brothers, um, we used to go and harvest butter clams and they'd get about two, 300 pounds of butters. And my brothers, my mother would ask my brothers to go and dig a great big pit. And it used to be about three feet deep and maybe about four feet in, in width and about another four feet. And it was a big pit that you can fit the 300 pounds of butter clams in there. And she would heat up the rocks and and um, we would layer all the clams and, the, and all of the um, greenery and put it in the pit. And we cooked them and we spent a whole day um, doing that. And after that was nicely cooked and then we would dry them in the open fire. And then after an open fire and when they were nice and dry, she would, um, um, my, my brothers would go and get some cedar, um, cedar bark and, and put it into a string and then we would, um, string about five or six butter clams on there and they'd be like a necklace and we would put it on like a necklace and we have six butters the clams nicely all dried and and we used to we used to go and trade with the Yakima Indians and we used to go down to Yakima and we would barter with them and we'd get our beads and blankets and and whatever we needed, and and that's where most of our clams would go, and yet we'd have enough to go and save for the winter time as well. So um, we were always doing something every every moon. We were always doing something. We were always busy. I have. Uh, I wrote down your mom's clam baking recipe, Celilia. And maybe we can share it with these folks. Okay. Yeah. I think we're, um, we're just about out of time. And uh, maybe this is a good place to stop our talk, although we have more slides. But um, we, we wanted to, to keep to about an hour. And if I'm not mistaken... Are we close to an hour already, Stephanie and me? Um, we started a little, we started at about quarter after. So we're just over half an hour right now. So if you guys oh. wanted to keep talking, there is sure. absolutely time for you to keep going through some slides. Okay, that's great. Thank you. So I just wanted to run through some of the foods that uh, we've been talking about, um, the greens. Um, for example, most of them are ready in the springtime like the scham -cham. Have you eaten mm. that, Celilia? The um, um, horse tail shoots. Um, yeah, we used to, and, and the sprouts. The um, We used to eat them in the spring. Do you call them um, sas saski? Um, saski. Yeah. Because um, we used to get the new shoots from the salmon berries and the, and the um, thimble berries. Um, we used to go and pick a bouquet of them and then I used to sit on the porch as a little girl and eat them one after the other. And um, they look like middle necks down below there. Yeah. Is that middle necks? Yeah, I guess they are. Or butters, I'm not sure. Oh. But. Oh, that looks nice though. Yeah. <laughs> they do look good. And in the summertime, of course, there's uh, the people would um, dig the camas bulbs in the in the early summer, and all the berries come ripe one one after another. Some of mm -hmm. them are early, like the strawberries and the elderberries and the um, the red huckleberries, and some of them are a little bit later, like the salal berries. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah, lots oh, of good yeah. nutrition. Lots food. of good times. Yeah, especially the strawberries. They look, they were so sweet. Oh, yeah. Yes, I love those. I always look forward to them. And at the mm -hmm. same time, uh, there are other things that people would harvest, like the 
cedar bark and the cattail leaves in the summertime um, to make mats. And people were mm -hmm. expert mat makers. I've got, uh, I've got photos of some of the mats that the uh, Saanich people made, and they're just beautiful. And yeah, of course, math. you go ahead and oh, talk I'll about Hoysam. <laughs> oh yeah, Hoysam. <laughs> it's um, um, soap berries. Um, I did some um, um, presentations over at uh, Penn Island. Um, introduced the Indian ice cream to the residents of Pender. And um, it's an acquired taste, but I used to look forward to them because that was our treat in the winter, winter time and the summertime. My mom would jar them and um, um, that was our Indian ice cream. So I always looked forward to them. When I was a kid, I used to have them all the time. And um, I, my grandchildren, I tried to give it to them, but like I said, it's an acquired taste. Um, but now um, our young people are getting pretty fancy now. They're putting different types of um, juice now into the soap berries and, it, and it's, easier, it's easier to eat for them. So, but I, I like the natural taste. Uh, I like that taste too, but it is an acquired taste. I yes. had to try it quite a few times before I got to like it. But um, I've made it with unsweetened apple juice some of my friends whip banana in with it. But yes, these, ber it. these berries are small, but they're juicy and slightly bitter. And uh, you, they have a, uh, the bitterness is due to uh, a natural detergent, um, saponin, and that's what makes it whip. So you add water to the berries and then you whip them with a special, you can use salal leaves or your no, hand sure. or a special whipper and yeah. whip them up like egg whites or something. And they, they look, they're really pretty. They're sort of a light pink color. And then you, you often will eat them with a special spoon that looks like a paddle. And people really enjoy eating the soap berries. It's almost like a party when you, when you whip them up. Yeah, you gotta make sure your bowl's nice and clean when you whip oh. them up because otherwise they won't whip. They're, they're you, like egg whites. That's right. You never let them get in touch with any kind of oil or grease or they won't whip. And, and everybody talks about that, knows that. There's one of those mats. This one is a, a, a sandwich mat that's made from tule or the round stem bulrush that grows around the edges of, of lakes, like Elk Lake has quite mm -hmm. a few. And people used to long wooden needles from the ocean spray plant and um, so actually stitch through the, the stems and then use the plating on the edges. And these mats, some of them are huge they, and they use them for tents, for mats, for drying berries on, all kinds of things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because they, uh, they used it for lining the longhouses because it, it would be like um, uh, insulation to keep the, the longhouse warm. That's right. And even for room dividers, uh, you know, if mm -hmm. you want to have little smaller rooms within a big house, you can use those. Re really important. Really? Yes. Yes, it is important. Is that ocean spray? Nancy? It is, Celilia. What is the... Can you say the Sanchakla name for that? The ocean spray is... Um, um, uh, yes, yes. Um, ocean spray, this, that's the flower from the ocean spray the, itself. It's a hardwood. And um, plus when the flower is at it, blossoms like what you see there now, when it's blossoms, the indicator that sockeye is at its peak. And it's usually around late July, August. Um, most likely in August, because August is when the sockeye is usually at, at its peak. So when these ocean sprays are at their flowering at, at full bloom, that, that's an indicator that 
Sakai is at its peak. Mm -hmm. Good time to go fishing. And speaking of fishing, there is Celilia with her fish. Oh. <laughs> I had to oh, put that oh, one in. Oh, nice. Gee, I, I haven't seen that picture in a long time. My grandsons, <laughs> I was teaching them how to smoke some sockeye. And that's she our looks, smokehouse. Looks pretty happy, eh? <laughs> oh, gosh. I really miss those days. We haven't had any sockeye now for for close to four years now. Um, but, oh, gosh. that's Oh, I took some of that when we went to Italy, Nancy. That's that right. To our slow food meetings. Everyone yeah. loved tasting it. Yes, that was, that, was that was awesome. Really fun. So here's some of the foods that people would get in the fall time, the sockeye and other salmon. The I guess later on the chums or dog salmon at Goldstream, right? In November. Yeah. And uh and the some and some yicham. 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 Right. The evergreen huckleberries. Yes. And also the bog cranberries are ready and the peat bogs like rithets and other bogs that uh, the Saanich people have have used for a long time. And the crab apples. Yes. Mmm, that looks good. And here's Christopher Paul again with the number one vegetable of the old days, the camas bulbs. Quiflash. Is that right? Yeah. Yes. And, uh, and yeah. yeah, he talks yeah. about he talked about how people would clear the land and um, and make these beautiful meadows that the camas would grow well in. That was from a long time ago, and they used. To, we talked with Bob Ackerman over on Salt Spring, and he, he remembered how the Saanich people used to burn over the area around Fulford Harbor and up into the, up the valley there to, to grow better camas and berries. So they still remember how to do that. And mm -hmm. um, it's amazing how dense the bulbs are of camas mm -hmm. in a good area. This is from one square meter of ground, all of these bulbs. And uh, one of our students, Kate Proctor, did her master's looking at camas and wow. she sorted nice. the bulbs. So you can see the year old bulbs are tiny. The two year old bulbs are bigger. The three and four year old bulbs are getting longer and longer and they're pushing their way down into the ground. So the bigger the bulbs, the deeper they are in the soil. And when you harvest them, you can just dig around the top and flip over the turf and just take out, select the bigger bulbs and take them out and then put it back, burn over the areas to create a, sort of an instant fertilizer for the new plants, mm. uh, not the seeds into the crevices when you're digging. And if you come back three or four years later, there'll be as many bulbs again. It's yeah. like... And over generations, people would mm -hmm. harvest the bulbs that way. That reminds me, Nancy, that, um, you know, when our people used to go and harvest the, the camas bulbs, and, and if, you, if they kept harvesting and harvesting and cultivating, that, that's their way of cultivating. They get bigger and bigger and bigger. But the, that goes to the same with um, digging clams, um, the butters. Yeah. We used to go and dig clams, and uh, when we used to dig them, and, and then that, um, and it left room for the other little clams to grow, and that's how we used to um, um, cultivate the, the butters as well as the little neck, and then made more room for them to, for the other ones to grow. And it, and it goes to the same thing with um, the camas. So, um, we have, you know, that was our way of cultivating, I guess you could say, mm -hmm. um, to make room for, for the camas, to make room for the other butters, the other little necks, for them to grow. But now that it's not active anymore, they're just, there's no room and they're just getting, they're really tiny now. So I think we, we need to start 
um, taking our clam beds, our oyster beds, and our camas beds, we need to start cultivating and making sure that there's room for them to grow. So it's, there's a reason for everything, I guess, eh, Nancy? Yeah, yeah, that's, I've heard that from many people up and down the coast, how you have to harvest it. It's part of the uh, management of these mm -hmm. species and you, they need to be thinned out or they won't grow well anymore. And so mm -hmm. uh, one of our friends, Brenda Beckwith, uh, worked on her PhD on and looked at camas tending and uh, she grew out some camas um, that, that she carefully separated and weeded and look how big they are there. You can hold just a few of them in your hand. They're that big around. Mm -hmm. So that's all important knowledge that goes with camas. And what happened to the camas? The livestock came in and the deer and I mean the, the cattle and the sheep and the yeah. pigs, they all, they all grazed the camas, introduced grasses, took over. Um, people built their houses on it and on them and um, converted them to farms and so forth. Mm -hmm. And so for so many reasons, they weren't tended anymore. And cam camas is much less common than it used to be. Oh, for sure. Mm -hmm. <sighs> even even uh, native, um, native deer versus the fallow deer. I know that the fallow deer are people, they tried eating it. They don't care for it. Um, they prefer the native deer versus the fallow today. Mm -hmm. Interesting. There's my nephew and my brother. Yes, exactly. And uh, Earl Senior and and uh, Celilia's parents and your your older brother Lou mm -hmm. um, knew about the reef net fishing. And Nick Claxton did his PhD work uh, on revitalizing the Saanich reef net because. This is a, a brilliant way of fishing, selective fishing for salmon. And, uh, but it was banned as a fish trap in the early 1900s by the Canadian government. They still allowed it over on the American side. And so Celilia's mm -hmm. family and others would go over to the American islands and still continue the reef net fishing there. But it's, it's really a brilliant system of catching fish um, in a sustainable way. Mm -hmm. Yes, it is. Um, my nephew, Nick, is trying to bring that back. And he's teaching the youth within our four communities to introduce the reef net technology. And um, I think they're going to include that this summer. So um, to do that traditional practice again. Uh, different families awesome. had their own reef net sites and they cut a swath through the kelp so that when the salmon would come through and they put a, a leader lines out with the dune grass tied to them so the fish were fooled into thinking they were swimming along the bottom but they were swimming up into the reef net which is mm -hmm. held between two canoes and made of willow bark so the reef net is called swala Am I right? Yes. Swala, yes. And the will, willow is called squala as well. And, uh, but there was always an opening at the far end um, for some of the fish to escape so that they could continue their way up the Fraser River. And then mm -hmm. they held the first salmon ceremony, the first fish that they caught. They stopped fishing for four days while they mm -hmm. celebrated the coming of the salmon. So the salmon mm -hmm. were allowed to continue on their way for four days um, before they started fishing for their families. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, here's a quote. Um, people were so worried about the loss of wetlands because the willow and all of the other plants that people use were found in these wetlands. And one of them in the Saanich territory, the Mabers Swamp, out on the peninsula, um, they talk, uh, Earl Claxton and John Elliott wrote a book about the Saanich reef net and talked about 
the local swampy ground that was drained by the settlers. Five little streams that pass through the village of Tsarlip, um have, have gone dry because they destroyed the, they drained the swamp and all of the plants. Mm -hmm. John Elliott's mother used to cry when they'd go by that swamp um, because she felt so bad about it. Cecilia Elliott, I wonder yeah. if these people know what they're doing, she said, because this was the end of a whole way of life for them, the loss yeah. of the, the material to make the reef nets. Yeah, they were heartbroken, our elders, when that happened. Medicines, herbs, berries, ducks, swamp reeds for mats and house lining, cedar for canoes, all this, she could see the end of a beautiful way of life disappearing. Mm hmm So true. Breaks my heart to think about it. And your mom witnessed a lot of losses in her lifetime. Yeah. But I'm happy to say... There's a lot of effort now to bring back and restore some of these beautiful places again and to re bring back the reef net fishing and harvesting camas bulbs. Mm -hmm. um, maybe you want to talk a little about your mom's 10 bark medicine. I will. Um, the 10 bark medicine, uh, my mom, um, she was taught by her father-in-law, my, uh, my dad's dad. Um, he taught my mom how to do the 10 bark medicine and it was a medicine for whatever ailed our, our people. He always made the 10 bark medicine and um, he was our doctor, I guess you could say here in Saanich, my grandfather. And um, I was fortunate enough that um, my mother taught me about the 10 bark medicine and she shared it with Nancy and um and I cried one day because I said to Nancy, I said, gee, I remember my mom talking about the 10 bark medicine, but I can't remember the ingredients. And Nancy said, I got them all. And I was very, very happy and fortunate that Nancy spent that time with my mom. And she wrote it down. And that I'm just so happy that happened because it would have been lost if Nancy didn't say that. And um, my mom is harvesting the 10 barks right there in the picture. And um, she taught me that, my mom taught me that before she, she left us. And um, she was already, I think in her nineties in that picture, um, uh, yeah. she was teaching us how to make baskets too as well and cedar baskets, Nancy and I, and, and she was showing us the 10 bark medicine. And um, Nancy and I keep saying, we're gonna get out there and do that. And uh, we just don't have the time. We always say when we retire, it seems <laughs> like we've gotten more busy, <laughs> more and more Both busy, uh. Both of us. And um, um, I just wanted to share that one little that story about how the people caught salmon. Um, once there was no seals, so the people were starving and they lived on, on elk and, and whatever that other game they could kill. And these two brave youths from, from Saanich said to each other, let, let us go and see if we can find another salmon. They embarked in their canoe and they headed out to the sea not caring what direction they traveled. And they journeyed for three and a half months and they came to a strange country when they, when they reached the shore, a man came out and welcomed them saying, you have arrived, you have arrived. And he says, yes, we have. And the youth answered, we are here now. And they said that they were expecting them. And so they asked them to come in and they shared a meal and they, shared their teachings and and they were there um, after they eaten had their had their dinner the host led them outside the house and said look around and see what you can see they looked around and they saw smoke coming coming from Gukmin and and the steelhead and the sockeye in the spring and other varieties of fish 
Well, anyway, so you stayed there for, for quite a while. They stayed there. And the host said, well, I think you must go home tomorrow. And everything was arranged for you. And the salmon that you were looking for will ma muster at your home and start off on their journey. So you must follow them. So the two young youth followed the salmon and uh, um, and every night they took the Ming and they burned it on, um, on their way home. And they burned some Ming on the beaches. And finally they reached Discovery Island and uh, they burned some more Ming. And for the host said, had said to them, burn Ming along the beach when you reach your land, when you reach land to feed, to feed the salmon that travel with you. That way you, you could treat salmon, the salmon will treat you well if you treat them well and you will always have them in abundance. And that is why Gakhming is so important. So then our, our young youth finally got home and, and um, they had plenty of salmon at Discovery Island and they taught their families about the other places, about Fraser and Nanaimo. And because their journey took them three and a half months, salmon are now ab are absent in the coast for that period of each year. The coho had said to the other salmon, you can go ahead ahead of us as far as we have not yet got what we wanted from the lakes. This is why the cohos are always the last of the salmon and the young men now have salmon, but no good way of catching them. The leaders of the salmon, a real man and a woman taught them how to make um, the swala. And that's when the reef nets came about. And and so the reef nets and the gakhning is important to the Saanich people. And, um, and that's how, um, the salmon became in abundance to our our savage people, and that was a story told my by my late dad, Johnny Claxton, and um, and that's how I learned about the the Kachming. and that's how it is important to to our savage people. Thank you. Wonderful. I'm glad you shared that, Celilia. We've sort of talked a little bit about it before, but that gives the complete story and and why mm -hmm. the reef net is important and why the willow is important, the wetlands and all of the different places uh, where they gather plants for that reef net. They all tie in together with the kachmin mm -hmm. mm -hmm. and the, the respect that people have for the fish and the plants and the medicines all. I think... Um, just, we'll just quickly finish this part about the Ten Barks Medicine. And, um, and then I think um, that's a good place for us mm -hmm. to, uh, to stop. Um, mm -hmm. So this is the Ten Barks Medicine and uh, it's sweetened with the licorice for seep, it's yeah. called. Uh, the rhizomes yeah. are very sweet and they help to make the medicine sweet because the tree barks are a little bit bitter, but there's mm -hmm. different, there's 10 different kinds and including the cascara and cherry bark and uh, crab apple bark and other trees. And um, we tasted it when Belinda's mom prepared it. It tasted like the forest, didn't yes. it? Tasted yes. like drinking the forest. It was just the most beautiful, fragrant, uh, foresty taste. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and it was used by generations of your family going back. I think not only the um, we benefit from all of the the trees and all the ten barks and all the different types of med uh, plants as our medicines. Um, I can share one more story about my grandfather when he was chopping wood and he went and hammered, he sharpened his ha ha or his axe, he went and sharpened it so sharp that he, um, he, um, he 
he sharpened, he broke his um, thumb. And um, he told my mom to go into the wilderness and go and look for his nail, a slug. And so my mom went and looked for one and, and um, she got this slug and she brought it to my grandfather. And, and because he, he just, I guess, chipped a bone or something in his thumb or, and, and, and the, so he took that slug and he cut it half in half lengthwise and he put that on his thumb and he, and he covered it up with a, a rag and like a, for a bandage. And he did this every day for about a week and then his, um, his um, injury got better. And so I asked Nancy about that. And I said, I wonder why they would use a slug. Because I never got to meet my grandfather and I didn't have a chance to ask my mother. And um, the conclusion we came to is that the slugs eat a lot of greenery. So it was a lot of medicine, I would think, I guess, say eh, Nancy? Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. So it has some of the medicinal compounds from the plants that it eats in it. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, yeah. To Lilia. Yeah. That was healed, and he some healed, healed up. <laughs> That's a great story. So uh, there's much, much more. We've kind of touched the surface and talked about a few plants. Um, we won't talk too much about the environmental destruction that's happened because we are all aware of that. But um, I think this is a lesson that we would like to leave you with, that learning and caring about the cultural richness and biological diversity in our own home places, wherever we live, is something that all of us can do to help. And it can bring endless fascination in our own lives and make a difference in the future. And yeah, learning by answer. doing, mm -hmm. learning mm -hmm. by doing. And uh, we'll leave you with this beautiful flower. <laughs> I spent a lot of time uh, with Elsie and Vi looking for this flower. We traveled all over looking for it because it's a good luck flower. And we brought, I couldn't find it. And we brought Vi home to Pakwachan. And there it was growing right by her house. <laughs> And here we drove all the way up to Nanaimo looking for it. <laughs> here it was down here close to Sydney. Yeah. But um, I remember um, an, another story. I went, I went picking, um, getting some medicine with my late mother and my late cousin Irene, Irene um, from Songhees, Irene Cooper. And we were looking for some medicine. And I, I only remember the Sanchathan names, but I don't know the English names. It was called C. Schooltin and C. Schooltin Tanad. It was a male and a female plant. And um, she, um, she says, I need to get the roots. And I said, okay. So we were busy looking for the plants. And then she showed me what they looked like. And she was walking ahead of me. And then finally, I said, Irene, you keep passing the plants. I said, you keep passing them. I said, and she says, where, where, honey? I can't see it, she says. And I said, right there. She says, where? And she, she couldn't see them. And I thought she was just pulling my leg, and she honestly couldn't see them. So anyway, we, we were harvesting the roots of these two, the male and female plants. And um, and then we got, finally got out of the wilderness. And I said, I said, I said, Irene, here's your plants. And she said, Honey, I can't see them. And and she says, Then I'm going to tell you why I can't see them. Those plants were hiding away from me. And I said, Oh. I said, How come? She says, Because I have bad intentions. And I said, oh, no. And I said, well, what were you going to do with them? And she says, well, I have my grandson's got a new girlfriend and I was going to split them apart by using these medicines. And those medicines hid away from me. So that's how come I couldn't see them. And <laughs> so I said, oh, no. I said, cousin Irene. And she says, 
now you got to respect the plants because if you don't respect them, they're not going to respect you. So she says, that's a lesson for me and you today, she said. I said, okay, cousin. So they do have feelings. They know what you're going to do. They know your intentions. So respect your plants, she said. And that's my lesson for today. <laughs> a wonderful way to end. <laughs> Thank you, Celilia. You're welcome. Thank Thanks you so much, to all of you. We always hear uh, from our different partners, when is restoring enough? Aren't we doing enough? Haven't we already start restoring the forest? But I think that with your eyes, uh, we realize that maybe there are many plants we are not seeing yet. And maybe because our intention has not been fully expressed yet. And we know that many of the partners have the intention of restoring this beautiful land. And I hope that those plants will show up to them and really show uh, good intention and goodwill and the idea of, you know, uh, connecting as you you have allowed us today. So thank you so much. I'm, I am totally caught by your stories. <laughs> yes, I, I agree. Thank you both so much for sharing. I, I can't even express how much it means to me to be able to hear these stories, Celilia, especially stories that you're sharing from your ancestors and your family members. It just, it, I, I always tear up. <laughs> I just, I, I recognize the, the importance of these stories. So thank you so much for sharing them with us today. Thanks, Celilia. <laughs> thank you, Dee. And thank